topic. The topic that we're going to talk about today, I'm putting under the category spiritual malpractice and Christian nationalism, a topic that's you can probably find hundreds of videos on it on YouTube and other sources. Um, why do I use the term spiritual malpractice? Well, medical malpractice we know is when either negligence or omission of a doctor or nurses or any other medical professional um, acts in a way that causes damage to patients, sickness, sometimes even death. And so, uh, and the talk today is going to be probably very specifically oriented toward the situation in the United States, but not limited in principles to that. And so sometimes doctors have to take very big insurance policies because of it. But there's the danger that believers, and this can be true of any of us, through failure to apply the teaching that's in the Word of God, the instructions that have been left for us in the Word of God, uh, for different reasons, we can cause major problems. And the topic that I'd like to talk about today, I wouldn't say I'd like to talk about it, but I feel a burden to talk about it, is what's called Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism is the concept, and, and if anyone wants the presentation after, because it's not going to be time to read each of the slides or even all of the verses as much as that specifically I'd like to do. Christian nationalism is the concept that our responsibility as believers is to establish that a country like the United States be a Christian nation, that the principles of the word of God be those that govern the, the actions and things in the country, and, and it becomes uh, something completely tied to it. Well, I will say before we go any further that we're absolutely thankful whenever there are policies, when there ever are actions that do act in accordance with what the Word of God says. But um, the problem is when people begin to teach those sort of things, they have some good things with it, but there's also a lot of bad things that come with it. Some of the things such as the fact that we are going to try to force people to act like believers when they're not believers doesn't work. It's uh, a question sometimes of actual persecution that the believers apply against those who do not profess to be Christians, whether they be atheists, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, whatever. It's often acting in, in actual with things with problems with racism. Um, it sometimes is now connected with bad application of science. Uh, true science never is in, uh, in conflict with the word of God, but these things happen. It's a thing of saying we're, we're better in ourselves. And so what's happened is this in many ways has become almost a cult. The people who are leading it in many cases are not even showing any evidence of being true believers. But what it is causing is many people to turn away, to go away from the Lord Jesus Christ instead of being affected, instead of believing the gospel. And so I'm going to go back to something that in the last talk I had, we talked about, I'm going to read these verses, but for our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. I have a passport from the United States. I have a permanent resident card from Ecuador, the country in which we live. When it comes time to... Uh, complete with taxes, I have to respond and need to respond legally and do to both countries. But my primary citizenship is not either Ecuadorian or um, United States, it's in heaven. And those of us who are believers recognize that we have responsibilities down here, but our primary citizenship and what should govern our way of seeing things is heaven. And so what does that make us? In 2 Corinthians 5, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. 
Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry to make things better in this world. It's not what it says. Has given us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead. Be reconciled to God. Because of the part-time work I do with flower breeding and agriculture, um, I've come into contact and actually have, would say, a friendship with ambassadors from the United States to Ecuador and from Ecuador to the United States. And it's interesting when you uh, have that contact, you understand how they act in a way that's different than a politician, in a way that's different to, as a citizen in the country where they are. And so our primary, if I could put it that way, responsibility before the world is to be an ambassador for Christ. It does not say here that we're instructed to make this world a better place, that we're instructed to try to be a political force. Just give an example from the United States some years ago, man called Jerry Falwell said we need to be the moral majority and so we're going to try to impose morality and things and it's turned out to be a very negative thing for the gospel uh, the next generation has lived anything but a moral life his descendants it's not what we're instructed to do we're instructed to see be a felt testimony before the world and so how is our responsibility before government? I read from 1 Timothy chapter 2. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Do we spend more time praying for the authorities or debating their political positions? Do we spend more time listening to the news, whether it's from the right or the left or the center than we do reading the word of God. How are our thoughts formed? When I talk to some, it's very clear. It seems to me that the thoughts are being formed more by news channels of one sort or another, whether it's um, a specific broadcasting or YouTube or print or whatever it is. Our responsibility before government is to be in prayer, for those who are in responsibility to obey when what the government's request is not in conflict with the word of God. And if it is in conflict with the word of God, it may require us to pay a price. Uh, that's been true through the ages. There are many who will are now in 2024 obeying and some of them will not survive this day because they're going to obey God rather than man. And so, as we go on, if we think back to the churches, we know what the situation was in Ephesus. They still held on to the truth, but they had become cold. They had left their first love. And then Smyrna, and Smyrna, they were faced with tremendous persecution. It cost the life of some. But there was a faithfulness there that was not going to be characteristic of the church that followed. One time when I was in China talking with a brother with whom I contact with on a more continual basis, I said to him, you know, we feel sorry for you. Um, we're here because we realize that you go through persecution. You face things that we do not face. His response to me was, we feel sorry for you. Because he said, we realize that those difficulties that we face are for our spiritual growth and blessing. We realize that it's for our 
actual uh, benefit, not to our detriment. And that's a difficult thing. There's none of us probably that got up this morning and if we prayed said, um, you know, I, I really like to be facing persecution. I'd like to be facing difficulties. But it's not what we ask for, but God knows what to send. I'm going to read the verses about Pergamos because of time. I won't read of some of the others, but it says, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write these things, saith he, which hath a sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, and even where Satan's seed is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a first few things against you, because there thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. These things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I eat of the hidden manna, to give him a white stone, and the stone of new name written, which no man knoweth, save as he that receiveth it. Satan is active, is a tempter as a seducer. One of the things that determines many things today in the Christian testimony, sadly, is things being done for either power or riches. Idolatry is not limited to some figure made out of gold, made out of wood, made out of stone. Idolatry is anything that comes between ourselves and God. And so the church of Pergamos was a little different circumstance. Instead of uh, things being faced difficult from the outside, what happened? Constantine, in the years shortly after 300, after Christ, um, Christianity became the dominant religion of the Roman Empire. Constantine said, we are a Christian nation. Empire. And did he do it because there was necessarily some work that had taken place in his heart of repentance and faith? No. no. No real clear evidence of that. He said that if I name this, it will be the most successful way to improve my political position. They will have a cult really toward this and, and there will be the worship and everything else. There was no working in hearts. Yeah, the persecution dropped off. People weren't facing the difficulties they were facing at the time of Smyrna. And so we know that there's three different ways to interpret the, the seven churches, the historical accounts of these seven different areas, perhaps the seven postal zones of what is now Turkey. There's the uh, historical thing, and when we look at Pergamos, there was a historical side when Constantine was the emperor, and we can apply those things today. Where is the church really growing in the world today? It's under the conditions of Smyrna, not Pergamos. And so, and we'll, there's a slide later that talks about it. It's considered the number one country in the world. In, pot, in the increase percentage-wise of believers right now is Iran. Iran has actually gone to be a minority practicing country for Islam. Iran, before the uh, when the time of the revolution, had 75,000 or so mosques. 50,000 of them have closed. People are dying daily as martyrs. What's number two? Afghanistan. Afghanistan is not a country where the the, uh, the situation is very pleasant or easy for believers, and it's more like Smyrna than it is like Pergamos. But we're living in a time of Pergamos, and perhaps it was the first example of Christian nationalism. We're going to declare this a Christian country. Uh, we're going to have it led by people who don't necessarily know Christ. And what happened, it was not for benefit, it was not for blessing. And so the question is, where are we to be building? Are we trying to 
be making this world a better place. We're trying to turn things into a Christian nation. When we talk about that, it's not a question of not desiring that every person who has the opportunity and believes on the Lord Jesus. That's what really changes things. But Abraham, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place where he should afterward receive an inheritance, obeyed and went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob. Stranger and pilgrim he was, the heirs of him, with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He didn't have the complete word of God like we have. He didn't have the light that we can have because we've got all the books from Genesis to Revelation. But he didn't look for making something in a sense down here. So how does it affect? Peter had a sword, drew it, smote the high priest's servant, cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus, then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath, and the cup which my father has given me shall I not drink it. Then the band and the captain, the officer that the Jews took Jesus, and bound him, and led him away to Annas first, for his father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. If the Lord Jesus, when he faced those things on in that those days, if he'd said, and he had all the power to do it, if he'd said, okay, we're going to overthrow the Romans. We're going to get rid of this power. He could have done it with the word of his mouth. He, as he won't need when we come back with him at the end of the tribulation, when he comes to set up his earthly kingdom, he can do things with the word of his mouth. He didn't come to make this world a better place without people being changed, without there being repentance and faith. And so our hope, our building is not for here. We are heavenly people. We're not to be building, trying to make something out of things here on the earth. We're to be strangers. We don't belong here. Pilgrims, we're passing through. And so this is a message that I believe has been vastly lost in much of Christendom today. And so it comes to the question, is our warfare spiritual or physical? Um, we know, I'll just read part of the first thing from John 18. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest this thing of thyself, or did others tell it of thee? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thy own nation, chief priests have delivered unto thee unto me. Why dost thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that it should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom. Now is my kingdom not from hence. And so the Lord Jesus had the power, of course, to dominate, to take over, to completely put things in order then. Pilate had one question. He, there was a number of questions he asked, but in verse 38 of this, is, Pilate said unto him, what is truth? That's the question he didn't wait around for an answer for. He said that when it and admitted that he could find no fault. But for political expediency, because he didn't want to be an enemy, he, he, he bowed to the pressure of the people. And so we know these are very well-known verses in Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to, to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, and against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. As it's often been said, the only offensive weapon that he had was the sword of the spirit, and it wasn't a physical thing for us now. It's the word of God. And yet, if you listen to Christian nationalism, they're saying, hey, we may have another revolutionary war, we have another civil war in the United States. We may have to take up arms to impose what um, we think should be the way the situation should be. The Lord Jesus made it very clear. The battles in the Old Testament were physical because they were an earthly people. Our battles are spiritual because we're a heavenly people. He's never instructed us to go out and take a sword. If it comes down to it, we should be the ones willing to die instead of taking a sword to defend ourselves against the attacks of the enemy. They choose to attack 
in a physical way, we know where we're going. That should be what our response is. And so how far has this gone? The Beatitudes of Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are the, the merciful. Um, a well-known author who's taken a, some, written some things very worthwhile reading to understand these topics is Ralston Moore. He had to leave the denomination that he was part of because of the pressure and they didn't agree with him. But he's, he's taken some very clear and very strong positions. He's had a number of preachers come up to him in, in recent months, years, when they have spoken on these verses in Matthew chapter 5. Many different ones have come up to him and said, I've had members of my congregation come up to me and say, where in the world did you get those ideas? Those things don't work now. That shows how far the departure has come from the teaching that there is in the Word of God for us. And so there we, again, need to go back to what the Word of God says. Another thing that's a common problem, and this is a common confusion, is sometimes the world says you have to choose between the lesser of two evils. The reality is if we choose between the lesser of two evils, we're choosing evil. I'm going to repeat that. If we choose between the lesser of two evils, we're choosing evil. When I was in the university, there was a large lecture class uh, that I went to several times a week in one of the chemistry classes that I was taking. And the class before that was called Situational Ethics. Well, I might have been in there for the last few minutes of it. The world says you can decide what to do based on the situation. But the instruction and for us is whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. When um, Peter had to face the high priest and things, uh, and he, he faced pressure, uh, what did they say? Didn't we not straightly command you? You should not teach in his name. Behold, you fill Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. I can't think of a single instance in the word of God where we're instructed to choose evil. Choosing evil is evil. And so this concept in the world that you can choose between the lesser of two evils doesn't work. We may have to choose things that will bring difficulties. Many believers have chosen things that have brought death. There's, but in the end, yes, we're to obey the laws of the land. We're not to say, you know, like a speed limit of 65 miles an hour or a speed limit of 100 kilometers per hour or whatever it is. That's not anything against the word of God. But if someone says to us, well, you can't have a Bible, you can't read the Bible, you can't talk about the Lord Jesus to other people, well, what do you do? You obey God rather than men. Suffer the consequences, maybe, and there may be consequences. But that is the difficulty that believers have now gotten in many cases into this debate of, well, if I have to choose between two people, what's the choice of the lesser of two evils? And so the greatest danger from for the believers in the time of Smyrna and for believers in different places around the world today is pressure from without. The greatest danger in countries where you don't have the same pressure from without is from within. I've often used the example of three plates. One plate has good food. Um, after this, I think Debbie has lasagna made. We're going to enjoy lasagna. A third plate on the other side is poison. What if we took that plate of good food and hit some arsenic in? Which is the most dangerous of the plates? Not the pure poison. It's the plate that has poison mixed with what is good. And so... When people come up with these things, they, what I'll say again, Christian nationalism, not everything they say, not every position they take is wrong. 
Um, I've even heard some of the things in the current conflict where Russia has attacked Iran, uh, excuse me, Ukraine. Well, you know, Putin is against this and that moral thing. Well, Satan's not a fool. He's got 6,000 years of experience observing humans. He knows that to make error and evil palatable, you mix it with something that's true. And so people often get confused with that. What's the, what's the real battle? If they take a survey, and they have taken surveys, less than half the people that have professed to be Christians in the United States uh, are saying that uh, they're going to get to heaven by good works. That's absolutely false. Uh, it's, a, it's a confusion. And if you ask people, oh, well, you know, just heard so-and-so died. Oh, they're okay. They, they were a good person. They're going to go to heaven. Well, I'm not a good person. I deserve to spend eternity in lake of fire. But I've been given new life, which is good. Thankfully, I have that, even though I still have the flesh. But I'm never going to get to heaven by anything that I've done. We all that are connected know that. But the sad thing is, when we spend energy trying to, in a sense, make this world a better place instead of really preaching repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're doing what? We're trying to fight battles where there is no war. We need to understand where the real war is. People are fighting battles where there's not a war. And energy is consumed on it. Uh, the armor of God is not being used properly. What's happened in recent years because of some of these things, over 40 million people in the United States in recent years in the surveys have stopped going to congregations. That's a very significant part of the population, about 13%. And so what, what's the other thing? When Christians become aligned politically, when they say, I'm part of such and such a party, and then they go and try to share the gospel with someone, and the person says, well, you know, uh, who do you support? Who are you behind? If you are supporting the candidate that's not their preference, what happens? They show that they will often shut their ears because they say, hmm, you know, I don't agree with you politically, so I don't want to hear what you have to say. Our much more important message is the need for someone to be saved, the need to repent before God and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we become politically aligned, what we do is we cut ears off. Just like Peter physically cut ears off, we can, with our mouth, also cut ears off. And so there's some terms that are very commonly used now. Maybe it's worth looking at them a little bit. A deep state, there's the Christian nationalism says, well, what's happened is the um, the government has people that are conspiring against Christianity. They're, they're attacking it. Uh, we have to fight that. Well, I think it's very clear that, yeah, that, there, that exists. Uh, people in, many people involved in, but not all. It's not a universal thing. We shouldn't be purveyors of conspiracy theories. We recognize that may be true, but I'm going to read completely three references that I have on the slide. One is from Proverbs 22. Bet on thy ear and hear the words of the wise and apply thy heart unto my knowledge. For it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee, then shall be, they shall be with all fit in thy lips, that thy trust may be in overcoming what people would call the deep state. No, thy trust may be in the Lord. I have made known to thee this day, even to thee, have I not written to thee excellent things and counsels and knowledge, that it may make thee know the certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. How do we combat these things? We have the word of God, the word of truth. That's what has real power. For rejoicing is this in 2 Corinthians 1, the testimony of our conscience that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you. We have the privilege to be messengers, to be ambassadors for Christ in this world. And so if we go out and we say we're going to, in some political or whatever way, fight these things, which I'm sure there are things, there are, no question. We're not going to get very far. We have to understand that some people thought, well, when the Lord Jesus was crucified and he rose from the dead, that 
that ended Satan's reign as the God of this world. Um, Second Corinthians chapter four, whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God has commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, to shine in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We recognize that's true. His, his head has been bruised, but he will, and we hope that that will happen very soon, be confined for a thousand years, briefly released, and then forever confined to the lake of fire. But he's still active. Our battle is spiritual. Our battle is not to try to take over governments. Our battle is to be lights in this world because the only thing that really changes is when there's a change of heart. There's a revival, that sort of thing in a country, not, not because Christians have been able to overthrow governments. Um, deep state's one of the terms. The other one's woke. It's a very common term. And it, it started, it, it's, it starts with the basis of awakening, the African-American thing. It was talking about the difficulties there have been. And the, the racism has been horrible. Horrible. And it, it's continued against for people from the color of their skin, if they're if they're from Latin America or whatever, and things. And so um, there's two sides to it. But one of them is when the Lord looked at Samuel, um, and there was a question, what are you going to do sending this boy out against Goliath? It said, the Lord... Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And said, so do you look after, you look on things after the outward appearance. In the time of rampant slavery before the Civil War and even after the Civil War in the southern part of the United States, there were people who treated their slaves like, if I could use the term dirt, and yet they'd be the ones standing up on Sunday preaching. Mm. Those two things don't go together. Those that don't look on the outward appearance. It's not the color of our skin or the, our stature or appearance that matters. It, so what does it say in Ephesians chapter 5? I have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame to even speak of those things which are done to them in secret. For all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatever does make, does make manifest of light. Wherefore he said, Awake thou that sleepest and rise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. And so when we come to someone who's talking about woke, who's talking about those things, and on one side explaining what it is to face persecution that many of us have not faced, although I've lived in, as a minority and most of my life in the country, uh, our response can be, yes, those things are bad. Those things are evil. The prejudices, the racism, and things that have happened uh we can talk about awake we can talk about the light and so there's opportunities often presented by understanding the failure of this thing jesus said to them you have a little while is the light with you walk that you have the light lest darkness come upon you for he that walketh in the darkness knoweth not where he goeth while you have light believe in the light that we may be the children of light these things make jesus departed and did hide himself from them so we can bring light the light of the scripture and light of the glorious gospel to these people. Issues. No question. Romans chapter 1. For this cause God that gave them up to vile affections, for even the women did change the natural use into that which is against nature, and also the men, leaving the natural use of women, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their heir, which with me. The whole question about, um, remember all the LGBT or whatever the, the things are. Um, we live in a time where people are trying to explain away and say that the Word of God does not teach that those things are evil. The Christian nationalist in general will recognize the evil of those things. 
And so, as I said before, it's not a question of saying everything they say is wrong. But the problem is, then it turns into hate. We need to remember that God hates sin, but loves the sinner and sends the son to die for us. Very good article written on this. I would recommend written by Brother Dick Gorgas, now with the Lord. And I think it's a thing that makes it very clear. Sin is sin. That doesn't change from the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. That doesn't change from the days of Romans 1. Moral principles do not change with time or dispensation. I think it's important to recognize that the temptations that may be difficult for me can be different for you or different from a person who faces these things. And so it's important to recognize that these things are evil. That has not changed. But there's another question. And I'm avoiding using names. I think it's going to take a difficulty to recognize. But one of the things I heard, I won't name the speaker, and in many things is very good. I listened to a message not too long ago on YouTube. And the speaker, very well known, said, well, you have to choose a candidate that's against abortion. I would agree. Candidate A suggested, this is, I've taken the names out, suggested Tuesday, this is, he'd support a national ban on abortions around 15 weeks of pregnancy, voting for the first time support for a specific limit on the procedure. As he seeks the White House a third time, candidate A has refrained from embracing any specific limit on the procedure, warning it could backfire politically, and instead suggesting he would negotiate a policy on abortion it would include exceptions for cases of rape, incest, and to protect the life of the mother. Candidate B from CNN on Wednesday signed an executive order to help ensure access to abortion in light of the Supreme Court's decision earlier this summer to eliminate the constitutional right to the procedure. And it goes on. In either case, do you hear anything about the baby that's murdered? And in both cases, neither one is taking the position that it's murdered. People become politically expedient, as they would say. And so if you said, well, Dean, which one of the two are you going to vote for? My answer is neither one I'm not going to vote. I couldn't, with a clear conscience, support either position. Uh, when I was teaching classes that included biology, we would show a film, very interesting film, that showed how rapidly from the time of the two cells uniting uh, the baby developed. It's a, so as that starts growing, it's, it's light. It's it from that very instance that we were looking forward to meeting a son or daughter that we don't know because it happened a month into our first, vice versa, it's expectancy of a baby. First person after the Lord that I want to meet when I'm in heaven. And so we cannot support. And people will take positions if they're unbelievers professing something about Christ, but they'll take positions. And so my question comes back to this. It's my own exercise. Different people have different exercises. I understand and respect that. My position as an ambassador for Christ says, yeah, I have things I have to complete here. But if I ask Todd Chapman, who was ambassador for many years from the United States to Ecuador, if I would ask Luis Gallegos, or Yvonne Baki or Natalie Selly, ambassadors I've known from Ecuador to the United States. Well, who did you vote for in the last election? They would, when you were the Ecuadorian ambassador in the United States, the U.S. ambassador in Ecuador, who did you vote for in the last election? When in your post as an ambassador in the country where you were serving, they would have looked at me and said, "What? What do you mean? I don't have. I can't vote there. It's it's not my position. I'm to represent the United States in Ecuador, and Ecuador in the United States. We're to represent heaven on this earth." And so I leave it to the conscience of each one, but the question is, either of the candidates, the are principal candidates for the United States presidency in the next election, neither one has taken a position, a clear position against it. It's a political position. And so the question is, did John the Baptist use the position of Herod to advance their spiritual position? One of the things that you often hear from a Christian nationalist is, well, we know that the person 
their their life doesn't reflect in everything else, but we need their their actions, their power, and so we, we'll overlook it because they're able to do it. Um, yes, they're in the position of being a president or whatever. God has allowed them to be in that position. The democracy reflects the characteristics of the people in the country. But when John the Baptist was with Herod, when Herod heard, therefore, he said, it, I, it is John whom I beheaded. He's risen from the dead. For Herod himself is sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, it is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. And so we know what happened. He ended up using, I didn't like it, he ended up using it to, to have John behead. I've rewritten the, the conversation as it would be if I could put it rewritten by a Christian nationalist today. The alternate version, John the Baptist, here they know you have a problem with your sister-in-law. We'll just overlook it. We sure could use your help with the Romans. You know, you've been appointed by them. It's about time we got rid of them telling us what to do. You're about the only one who's in a position to lead us in this effort. Herod, I think what is going on between my sister-in-law and me is our business. And I'm glad you see it that way. Just have you and the others follow me, and I will lead you into freedom. John the Baptist responded, of course, we'll follow you. You're not the only one we, you're the only one we trust to do what is right. The current situation is very wrong. We must do something. Herod, thanks for your support. That's not where we're going to find the word of God. But that is the application of these principles that are false and wrong to what's happening in the world today. And especially in countries like the United States. And so what happens is um, um, we have to be careful as to who we allow to speak for us. We know very well the case of the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16. I came to pass as we went to prayer, certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her pastors um, much gained by Dutsu, saying the same followed Paul and, and us and cried, saying, these men are servants of the Most High God, which show us the way of salvation. She did this many days, and you oh, well, listen to that, that doesn't sound too bad. You know, these are people that are pointing us, and they're serving God. Well, we know that the title that would be correct in that time, in the time of the church, is well, it's not a wrong thing, but it's, it, it's not using Most High God. But they recognized this woman wasn't real. They recognized that this woman was possessed. And so uh, they commanded the evil spirit, the demon, to come out of her, and he did. So it didn't make people very happy. People are making money off of this, and people are making money off of Christian nationalism, the support from the so-called televangelists and everything else is tremendous. So they ended up being put in jail for it. They didn't say, well, it sounds okay. So we really, you know, we'll let, let, let this woman speak for us. People are going to hear that. And, and they're going to say, oh, yeah, let's come hear about salvation. Don't be fooled. God doesn't ask us to have people speak for us that don't even know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. We recognize that there have been people who've shared the gospel who were not believers and that sort of thing. That's a different thing. But we don't choose that to be the ones to speak for those of us who are believers. And so what happens when um, I remember very distinctly being in a bus from La Paz, Bolivia to the uh, southern Sierra in Peru, going along by Lake Titicaca many, many years ago with Brother Bob Tony, And he made a statement. He said, faithful men do not have a follower. And I'm not talking about the leadership that there may be in a business organization or something else, but the following is the type of following that I'm going to worship someone. I'm going to give them a place that really doesn't belong to another person. And so when Moses went up to the mount, he didn't, they stayed longer and said, I'll make his gods which go before us. And for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we, we what not has become of him. So they, they took their gold and they made a golden calf that they worshipped it. Who's getting our worship today? Who's getting actually the worship of Christian nationalists today? It's not Christ. It's people who've taken a position and, and are leading it that are getting the worship and the attention. And that is not something 
that is pleasing to God. And so the question is, will a man rob God? I'm going to put it in, I, I'm sorry that I even to say this, read this, but I'm going to read this specifically. I'm not going to use a name, but it says before and after, replace the name with Canada Day's historic indictment and the arrangement countless provocateurs have been noting during the Holy Week timing of blasphemy comparing Canada Day to Jesus. As, as Christ was crucified and then rose again on the third day, so too will Canada Day. Created one right wing lawyer known for representing January 6th insurrections. Since late 2000, a, a US fact checking of rather curious and controversial images has been floating around the internet. It's an image of a painting that shows Canada Day crucified like Jesus with an American flag serving as a one cloth worn by Jesus in the most artistic description. The Canada Day has declared himself the King of Israel or the Chosen One, and his followers have not shied away from calling him the Second Coming of God. A bill born uh, with this candidate, and under it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and government shall be on his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That's robbing God. As taking a place that only belongs to the Lord Jesus. And if we support that, we uh, then we are stealing the place that the Lord Jesus has place that belongs to him alone. And so when we understand that if we apply things in a wrong way, if we um, misapply scripture, if we fail to recognize the time and place in which we are, we are in time, it's important to understand the day of grace, not under the law. Something that's on the forefront of the news all over the world is Israel. Um, and trying to understand it, maybe I'm departing from the subject, but I'm showing this in a sense to say we need to understand where we are and what the way of doing things is. Israel rejected the Messiah. Thankfully, there are exceptions, but Israel as a nation rejected the Messiah. They were, after Titus in AD 70, the, things were destroyed there, the temple. 1948, they were able to get back uh, to being a nation. Um, it has not been easy. But when you want to understand what's happening in Israel and Gaza today, the soldiers, Minister Netanyahu, are going back and applying the instruction that was given by Samuel in dealing with the Amalekites. There are videos saying wipe off the seed of Amalek, um, chanting that you can find. I'm going to read what it says in 1 Samuel 15. Samuel also said unto Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken uh, thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus say it. The Lord of hosts, I remember that which Mal Am Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, both slay, but slay both man, woman, infant, and suckling, oxen, and sheep, camel, and ass. And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Talion, 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. Saul said to the Kenites, go, depart, get you down from among the Amalites, Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them, for you showed kindness to all the children of Israel. And they came up out of Egypt, so the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. So they're applying, specifically naming Amalek today. And so what's happening? It's not just Hamas, or maybe Hezbollah from Lebanon, where the soldiers and Leaders of those groups are being killed, but it's going to wiping out entire populations. And so, yes, there's protests in the world, and since what's happened, they Israel had every right, every need to to defend themselves, need to try to recover the hostages, but they're acting under Old Testament principles. Much of Christian nationalism is acting under 
Old Testament principles in a wrongly applied way. I think it's a mix and that's another topic that it's the difficulties that also come because people teaching covenant theology that were under covenants in the day of grace. The price of having rejected the true Messiah is causing Israel to be under tremendous pressure today. The cost for the Christian testimony because of the misguided teaching and actions of Christian nationalism is also causing tremendous difficulties for the testimony of believers today. The question in I won't read it all, but it's in, um, you can, it's summarized in Isaiah 39 about, about Hezekiah. It says, then said Isaiah to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Till the days come that all that is in my house and all that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt be get, shall, shall they take away, shall be eunuchs. In the palace of the king of Babylon, then said Hezekiah to Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. He said, Moreover, for there shall be peace and truth in thy days. Maybe it's like First Kings 19 to 22 or something. It's easy to look up. But what did Hezekiah basically say? Well, yeah, okay. Uh, where I'm, when I'm living, it's going to be peace and truth. You know, that what happens to the future to my children, it's kind of like, you might say, too bad, so sad. What's happening today is. The next generation is being sold out. It's part of the reason why the there's so much departure from young people uh, from following the Lord, from the, from taking from Christian testimony. Um, Hezekiah sold out at the end. Let's be careful that we don't sell out. Where do we set our gaze? Where foreseeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. The sin which just so easily beset us, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of the sinners against himself, as to be wearied and faint in your mind, should not resist him into blood. Not yet resist unto blood striving against sin. Let's look up. Let's not look to follow someone here on this earth. Let's not look to say our objective is to make this world a better place. Our objective is that people come to know the Lord Jesus as their Savior. That we be lights in this world that's so full of darkness because eternity is ahead. Many are already in eternity. All of us are going to be in comparatively very short time. Let's not be pulled down by wrong teaching, by false instruction, by something that's not what the Word of God teaches, even though it has the banner of Christian over the top of it. Let's set our gaze, our hope, our life on the Lord Jesus Christ and serving Him, being ambassadors for Him in this world that is so full of darkness. We just pray. Bless the God and Father. Help us. This is not a topic that's enjoyable at all to talk about because of the negative side of it. But we do feel the need that we be warned of the dangers of the teaching that's becoming so prevalent and causing such difficulties, causing people to turn away from the Lord, causing people to reject the gospel, causing true believers to be pulled into what's incorrect. We just ask that the Lord Jesus be glorified. Our lives would reflect what we are as ambassadors for Christ with the ministry of reconciliation and the little time that's left in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'm very open to being corrected. Thank you, brother, for speaking very plainly on some of these matters and for bringing those scriptures to bear, too, to, on that. I feel like that's there's a need absolutely right now for those very things. I could think of a lot of topics I'd rather talk about. 
brother Bob Brimlow, when he was asked, uh, Bob, who are you going to vote for? He used to say, well, I've already cast my vote and my man is sure to be in. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're, if you're worried about wars, well, there's going to be absolute peace during his reign. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. um, if you're worried about the climate, the uh -huh. earth is going to flourish during his reign. If you're worried about the animals, they're all looking forward to it. The creature mm -hmm. looks forward to it. Mm -hmm. And this went on. I, <laughs> and he said he won't be for just four years. It'll be for a thousand years. Yeah. Dean, what was that article by uh, Dick Gorgas you referred to? He spoke on, he, it's just a one page article on, um, on homosexuality, actually. It's, a, okay. I don't know if it's in the BTP library. I can think I can find it in my file, but it was basically saying, you know, the sin of sin, that hasn't changed uh, at the, the same time. It, God hates the sin, not the sinner. Um, and uh, I think it was the clearest, actually translated into Spanish and published it in the previous issue two and two years ago. Um, because it, you know, it's, it's very clear. I think all sin is evil, not all sin is equal. And, and so that's a, a perversion that's never right. Things, but if I could find it, if I do, I'll try to share it through this a scan right. of it. This okay. connection. It might be in the. I haven't looked in the BTP online library. My wife and I were um, recently. We just this last weekend we went to the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. And mm. I was struck by how history could have looked different if two sides would have just said, I stand down mm. and said, I want your blessing over my rights. Mm. There could have been hundreds of thousands of lives that were saved and hundreds of thousands of men's lives that were not altered. The casualties from civil war and standing up for one's rights were very, very clearly seen during the civil war. Hmm. Well, it's, it's very striking at Arlington National Cemetery that has people from the different wars What's the biggest section? In Civil not War. War. The Civil War. Not World yeah. War One. Not World War Two. Not the Korean War. Not Iraq, Afghanistan. It's the Civil War. And so I really thought about that. Sometimes it's the greatest the greatest casualties and the Christian testimony are from turn inside, not outside. Yeah. Well, I have a question. Yes. The mm -hmm. fact that uh, nations do exist in the world, right? Mm -hmm. um, is it out of place for the fact that we are of a certain nation that it affects us? Or should the fact that we have a nation on earth not affect the Christian at all. Oh, I think no, I think it, it does. It, it's where we've been placed in the word of God. They they work in the under the natural circumstances where they were. Um you know I I thought uh, because of traveling um and things it's been um you know, having the passport that I have, it's given access to many places. I have 
the same time wondered about getting an 